and welcome back to Book Talk. In today's episode, I get to introduce you to my new writing friend, Heather Kaufman, and I am delighted because we are talking about her new novel, Up From Dust. And this is such a interesting and a fun book because we're going back in time to the biblical times of Martha, one of my favorite I guess I would actually call it like a heroine of mine from Bible times. But before we get into that, Heather, I want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself. So do you want to take just a moment and let everybody know a little bit about you? Sure. Thank you so much, Kara. Um, this is such a treat to get to talk to you today. Um, my name is Heather Kaufman. I am married to my husband, Andrew, for 13 years. Yes, 13 years. That's we have awesome. three kiddos. Um, a nine-year-old, a six-year-old, and a three-year-old. So our house is very loud, very, very loud. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I I am a, a mom and an author, a former editor. I just love all things books. And so this is a really uh, wonderful treat to get to talk to you today. I love it. And it's fun because Up From Dust is not your first book, but it's it was, from what I could tell, it's about your third, maybe your fourth book. So tell me about how you came up with the idea for this book, because it's about Martha, who really is one of my favorite biblical characters. And so what was it about her and her story that made you go, I have to write a novel centered around her? Yes, absolutely. Um, so it's, it's very interesting. Um, my first two books um, are in a completely different genre. They're contemporary fiction. Honestly, if I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, biblical fiction was not on my radar um, to be to write. Um, but I would say back in 2016, I during an Easter sermon, um, it was on the resurrection of Lazarus, and I don't even remember the particulars of the sermon. But I just remember being just startled by this deep admiration for Martha. And I think up until that time, I think especially those of us who maybe grew up in the church, we've heard these stories for years and years. The overwhelming message about Martha has seemed to be a little bit cautionary, kind of like, don't be a Martha. <laughs> yeah. And for some reason, it just hit me. I mean, I've read that story in John 11, I don't know how many times, but it hit me what a woman of faith she is in mm -hmm. that chapter. And I was just startled by this deep admiration for her. I'm like, I want to become more like this woman. Um, why haven't I heard more about that? And so I started thinking, what has gone in, what has happened in this woman's life, the Martha that we see with the Mary Martha moment in Luke to this moment in John, where she's just this amazing woman of faith, what has happened in her heart and her mind to affect this change? And it just started me down this rabbit trail of just wondering about her and as a person. And um, honestly, I shoved it aside for years and years because I was like, this this is too hard and scary. I don't know that I want to write <laughs> biblical fiction. Yeah. But the idea was so compelling to me. Martha herself was so compelling to me that the idea just wouldn't go away. And finally, I knew, you know, I, I have to write this. This is something that I have to write. Um, so, yeah, that's the genesis of the story. All the way back in 2016 till now, it's kind of surreal. <laughs> I love that. And I think that so many of us have a story like that, where there was something, some moment where an idea grabbed a hold of us, and then it just wouldn't let go. And no matter what was going on, what was happening in our lives, we were like, we have to write this, it has to come out of us. And there's something about Martha where it, it it's so true. If we grew up in the church like you and I did, we heard the stories. And it was always, don't be a Martha, don't be a Martha. And I'm like, um, God gave me a Martha personality. He really did. I am one of those people who I work and I work and I work. And I'm like, we need Martha's where nothing's going to get done. But we also have to kind of balance it with that Mary of sitting at his feet and all. But I'm like, that's just not how I'm wired. So I've always been kind of like that. I want to jump up and defend her and be like, we need Martha's. We need Martha's. She's a, like I said, she's a heroine of mine. So as you started, as she wouldn't let go of you, what was it that kind of kept pulling you back? What element, how did you kind of keep thinking about her faith? And what was it about it that kind of kept tugging you back to imagining how her faith grew and became that transition from Luke to John? Yeah, yeah. So 
it just intrigues me that she is the recipient of one of those seven I am statements in John, where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He is saying this to Martha, to the busy Martha, right? He is engaging her in theology. And what's so fascinating to me is he is saying this and he's actually asking her to affirm this. He says, do you believe this? And it just struck me of how much offense she could potentially have taken in that moment. Her brother is cold dead in a tomb and he is purposely delayed and he is asking her to confirm with her mouth out loud yeah. I am the resurrection and the life and she does she does yeah. and I think that that right there is so compelling to me it's one of the strongest confessions of Jesus's identity in the gospels and it's in the mouth of Martha of Bethany and like that right there just would not let go of me like I just couldn't get over that and I just wanted to keep returning to that moment of this is the epitome of faith right here where she is affirming Jesus as the resurrection and the life while her brother is dead in a tomb. So that, that yeah. right there just excited me. Yeah. That's incredible. And when you think about it, there is such a dichotomy and such a contrast of her brother's dead in the tomb and Jesus could have, he could have come early. He could have, or not even early because he could have kept Lazarus from even getting sick. And yet he didn't. And he delayed. I mean, scripture is very clear. He chose to delay when he could have prevented the death. And there's all these questions that it's one of those, I can't wait to get to heaven and be like, okay, can we unpack this now and explain to me exactly what you were thinking and why there was this delay? Because I know there's a purpose, but it makes no earthly sense why you would allow the pain and suffering of death for Lazarus, for his sisters, for everybody who knew him and cared about him, for Jesus himself who knew him and cared about him. Um, Cause you've got, you know, the shortest verse, he wept inside that context. And it's just, it's, there's so much, there's so much, but that actually leads to one of the reasons that I'm not going to say never, because as soon as I do, God will say, oh yes, you will. But the idea of writing biblical fiction is heavy to me because there's such a weight. There's such a I don't want to mess it up. If I yes. get a detail wrong writing World War II fiction, it's not going to change the course of history. It's not going to change the course of someone's faith. But it feels like biblical fiction is heavier. Yes. So how did, did it feel that way for you? I mean, what was it like to, to go into that? I mean, contemporary fiction to faith fiction. I mean, like yes. faith, 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 faith fiction. Yes. Yes. Um, it, it Heavy is a really good word for it. I mean, it, it is fiction and I'm very clear up front with that. I am in no way. So I, I approached it in no way. Am I trying to contradict what we know in scripture to change what we know for a fact from scripture? And then there were certain choices that I made. I wanted to treat um, any scene with Jesus just very reverently. The words in his mouth, I tried to keep as much as I could words from the from the Bible itself. So there were certain boundaries that I put up for myself that I knew I wanted to kind of stay within. Um, but still, I, I did sense just this um, weight and in, in just um, the stewardship, I guess. And I, mm -hmm. I honestly, I just, I prayed a ton um, because right now Martha is alive. She's my sister yeah. in Christ. She is a real person. Um, these events, a lot of these events, you know, really happened. And so I was just very keenly aware of that. And so I just bathed it in prayer. And um, I wrote truly from just a place of worship and just, this is, this is for you. This is incredibly hard. <laughs> and some days I'm yeah. like, this is too hard, <laughs> but I just kept in mind, what is my purpose? My purpose honestly, with this book is that people would put it down and pick up their Bibles, that people would be more in love with Jesus Christ after reading this book. And I just kept that in mind. And I'm like, if, if one person can say, wow, I am that much more in love with Jesus. Wow. I want to, I just want to dive into the Bible. Like if one person can say that mm -hmm. all of this is worth it, all of this is worth it. So really that purpose kind of fueled me. And then I just kept bathing it in prayer and just crying out to him of like, equip me. I am very sinful. I am very normal. I am not up to this. <laughs> this is too hard. And I just kept bathing it in prayer and keeping that purpose in mind of, of helping people fall even more in love with Jesus. I love that. That is a really neat posture to take when writing a book like this, you know, where you're dealing with someone who, 
I don't even think you have to be someone who's um, grown up in the church and like an expert in the New Testament to be familiar with Martha and be like, okay, I know something about this woman. And so then to pick up a book and, you know, kind of be confronted with a, a new level of her story. And then for your book to be coming out while The Chosen is so yeah. well known and such a part becoming such a part of almost popular culture it's such a, a a great time for your story to kind of be added to the conversation of what would it be like to interact with Jesus yeah. at that level um so it's it's really neat how God kind of pulled all of that together to have you have this um you know yearning to really dig into her faith and her journey um, so what was it like, though, to have to, you know, do that research? Because um, I think, you know, you've even got recipes and things like that, that you <laughs> have put together. And when I saw that on your website, I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, even thinking about it, because like when I do World War II spam recipes, I'm like, Wah, yuck. <laughs> but then I was like, what would it be like? to cook I guess olive oil and grapes and but I mean what 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 kind of research did you have to do to even figure out yeah that? yeah yeah I I started well I started first with the bible I, I read through the biblical accounts um and with commentary so that's where I started and then I started with kind of the eagle's eye broad view picture of just what was daily life like at the time. And there's just, we live in, there's so many wonderful, wonderful resources. So really that's where I started everyday life um, in Martha's time and just referring back to commentaries and things like that. And mm -hmm. honestly, once I had that big Eagle's eye view, I just had to dive in because I'm the type of person where I could research to death. <laughs> like yeah. I'd be like, just research, 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 read, 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 and then never actually write. So I had to like kind of cut myself off at some point and be like, okay, you have enough of a big picture. You need to actually start writing. <laughs> yeah. So I would get that big picture. I, I jumped in and I started writing. And then honestly, questions just kind of popped up as you go. Right. And so I would flag them and I would dig deeper into those things. So like shepherding, that was a big thing. What was that like? And just the timeline of Jesus's final days and, and all of that. So, um, yeah, I would say that's where I started. It, it was a very daunting task, but I started kind of big and then telescoped inwards as I went. So what's one of the quirkiest things that you learned as you were researching? Because I agree, it's so easy to get lost in all the details as you start kind of digging in and and learning everything. But what's something that you were like, oh my word, I never would have imagined that that was a thing that just kind of oh, shocked you. Oh, goodness. Yeah, yeah. I, You know, honestly, well, the first thing that came to my Mind, um, with some of the speculations out there with, so there's a one verse in Mark where there's a young man in the garden of Gethsemane that flees naked. I don't know if you remember uh, that, yeah. <laughs> but there's literally one verse in all of scripture and not to give anything away, but I identify, I have identified that young man and he's like a character in, in the book. Um, and so I did some research. And so there were some really bizarre um, ideas out there of who that person might be. And so I would say that was kind of the funnest thing to see all of these speculations of, of who this person might be. People thought it was like a resurrected person or like uh, there was just a ghost. And like there was all of these like speculations surrounding that. So I found that to be kind of oh, interesting, wow. maybe a little yeah. humorous. So <laughs> That would be that's really fascinating. Yeah. 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 A Jewish ghost story from yeah, you know, the well, first I didn't century. go that route. I didn't yeah. go that route. <laughs> that's but you know, to even think that pe that's you know something that people were speculating on. Who knew? Mm -hmm. Um very, very interesting. So what's your schedule like? Because you've got three relatively youngish kids, nine, six, yes. and three. Um, and I very much remember those days. And, you know, there's a lot of chaos and you're writing um, your book deadlines are December 31st, which is a terrible book deadline. Ask me how I know this. Um, and so what's your rhythm like? How do you actually get it done when you've got the chaos of young kids and an active family and an active household? Where do you find the time to do all this research in the writing? 
Yes, that's a really good question. Um, I'm one of those writers where I actually don't write every day. I know some people really swear by that and say that you should, but it just, in my stage of life right now, it's just not um, really feasible for me to do that. So what I've done is I've worked into my schedule certain blocks of time um, that I know the kids are going to be in school and my youngest is going to be in preschool. And so I have a chunk of usually like three to four three and a half ish hours that will be completely kid free. And then that's where I get a bulk of my writing done. And so that's like a handful of times a week. I know that's my writing time, but you know, writers were always working. And so, you know, I'm reading after the kids go to bed. I am jotting things. I have notes in so many places. It's obnoxious. I wish I was more organized, but I have notes scribbled everywhere. I have notes in my phone. Um, and so I'm always thinking, I usually, at the end of a writing session, I give myself a task and it's like, figure this one thing out or figure out the next day's worth of writing. And I'll think about it. I just think and think and think and jot a tons of notes down so that the next time I know I can sit uninterrupted, I kind of have that springboard to to jump off of. So that's how it's worked for me is I try to make sure that I have a few chunks of time and that those times are really productive. Well, thanks for sharing one of your precious chunks of time with me today. Yeah, I do. Absolutely. It is. <laughs> I mean, I can remember getting a babysitter and going to Panera and just yeah. sitting at Panera and going, I have a deadline. And so I have to get writing done. And that was the only time because I was homeschooling. I was teaching a couple classes and I was like, I, this is how I could kind of get the blinders on, but yes. it was at a Panera. And so there yes. was still stuff going on, but it wasn't my kids going, Hey mom, I need yes. this or I need that. And, it, but it was that same idea of, I had a chunk of two or three hours and that was, you know, head down. And I would consider my bagel in a coffee as my rent for that. Yeah you know, slot of time. And I was just like, okay, this is what I'm paying to have quiet ish for two yeah. or three hours to get some writing done. And there were a lot of books that were written at a Panera. And so, yeah, you do, thank you, you have Panera. Do. <laughs> yeah. Yes. As I say her in my Panera cup again. Um, so when you're writing, do you tend to, are you, a, it sounds like you're a little bit of maybe a plotter, maybe kind of middle of the road, pantser plotter, which way do you kind of fall? I really am kind of a combination. Um, I definitely do not outline the whole book. Mm -hmm. I have broad strokes in place. I kind of know, you know, I know where I'm ending up. I kind of know some big things that I want to happen along the way, um, some character things, um, but I really don't plot it out. What I do is I kind of like I liken it to like a flashlight. Like I click that flashlight onto the next step. <laughs> I just have to figure yeah. out that next step. So I have those broad strokes, but then I plot usually like a chapter or two in advance. So I might sit there and be like, okay, here's all the things that need to happen in the next two chapters. So I kind of plot as I go, but not mm -hmm. really that strictly, if that makes sense. So I'm kind of it a does. combination. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's, it works for you, but it's that yeah. idea of, you know, kind of, what's coming next, but not the entire scope of your yes. book, which makes sense. Yes. Um, so what's your biggest challenge as a writer? Oh, honestly, um, probably my perfectionism. <laughs> um, I just, ooh, it's so hard. Like I, I have a hard time letting messy writing be messy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so it's really hard for me to be like, you know, sometimes it just matters uh, more to get the words out than it is to get them right. <laughs> yeah. And so that's really hard for me. Um, but I've had to learn, especially when you're under deadline, I've had to really learn, like, you know, sometimes you just have to get the words out and you know, they're not yeah. going to be great, but you can't refine something that's not on the page. And so I think that to me is my perfectionism and my desire to get a scene just right um, before moving on can really kind of trip me up. Sometimes it works in my favor, you know, if it's a big scene and I'm like, no, I really need to get this right before I figure out. But oftentimes <laughs> it just trips me up because I get so hooked, caught up on trying to get it just right before I move on. So I'd say that's probably my biggest, my biggest. Do you think hurdle. that's your background as an editor? Yeah, that probably is. Yes. I have a master's in English. And so it's just, I don't know, it's really hard for me to like, sometimes take that editor hat off where I'm like, yeah. oh, but there's so many things wrong. <laughs> like, yeah, I see them all. <laughs> like, 
I could see that where, you know, you could get so stuck in. And I remember when I was getting started and I was in a couple of crit groups and I was never going to get past chapter four. And I finally had to be like, I have learned enough. I have to quit submitting chapters because no editor is going to offer me a contract if I don't finish the manuscript. And so yes. I was just like, okay, I've, I've got to get it done. And, you know, I go, I look back and I'm like, somehow I knew that that's what just needed to happen. Um, and yet so many people never get past that point of that first six or 10 or however many chapters because they kind of get stuck in that loop of it's got to yes. be absolutely perfect. I'm like, yes, but we also have to get it done. And it is, there's that tension. And I've yes. got a, a tight deadline right now where I'm like, I'm never going to get this book done because it's kind of that trapped in my head. And so it never goes away. This is book 41 and I'm still trapped oh. in my head. So, <laughs> so what brings you joy when you're in the middle of writing a book, you know, cause it's a lot of work and it's a lot of stress and it's a lot of getting stuck in your head at different points, yes. but what part of it makes it worth it? What brings you just joy in the journey? Uh, and I, I think, um, I don't know when I do get a scene that feels just right, or I get that sentence that just sings, you know what I mean? It's like, it's just, I know we can be harsh on ourselves. We're, we're our worst critic, but you know, when you have a sentence that sings, like, you know, and I think when you hit that, where it's just like this, this is ministering to me. Um, and it's just so beautiful. Cause you know, it's like, Oh, this is going to minister to others because it's ministering to me. And I think that is what makes it all worth it for me. Um, and just my own growth. Like I can honestly say, I think the nature of this book too, God has really used it to draw me closer to him than I've ever been because I've just felt my dependence on him in a very stark way. And so I think too, just that nature of feeling so dependent on him as you're writing is also brings me joy because it's, it's just this walk of faith where you're like, I don't know how this is going to happen. And you just have to walk by faith. So I think that brings me joy. And then just when you hit those moments where, you know, it's working, um, that just, it really does just a well, a well-placed word, you know, it just brings me deep satisfaction. <laughs> I love that. That's so cool. I hope you always feel that. And it never becomes just a job because, and there yes. will be days where it's a job, you know, that's what deadlines yes, are for sure. Yep. But it is just, it's really cool when you have those moments. And for me, it often happens in after the draft, when I go back and I'm like, oh, I wrote that. And because there's always a point where I hate yes. a book and I'm like, this is going to be the last one. No editor's ever going to ask for another book. And then I get to reading through it. I'm like, oh, oh, it isn't garbage. This is actually right. okay. Okay, God, thanks. This is okay, you know. Yes, yes, yeah. It's like and a pleasant, kind of it's pleasant surprise. You're like, wait, what? Yeah, yeah. You're like, okay, yeah. this turned out all right. Um, and so we've got time for just a couple more questions. But when did you first know you wanted to be a writer? Oh goodness, um, I'm one of those that I think I kind of all, always knew. Um, I was like writing poetry when I was like six years old. Um, I started writing fiction when I was probably like. 11. Um, and I just remember distinctly, I was probably 11 or 12 and just standing in my room being like, I think I want to do this. This is what I want to do. That's awesome. And so it's just always, yeah. always been something that has brought me to life. Like stories are just something that's a part of me. And so, um, yeah, I think probably when I was like 11, 12 was when I was like, I just think I want to do this forever. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I still have my first journal that we got handed in third grade and my version of the Todd and or T frog and toad stories yes, where, yes. that I had to illustrate. And I'm like, okay, so I've been writing since I was nine. No one else is ever going to see those, but you know, it's kind of fun to look back and go, okay, I was doing this from a long time, but you know, then it was 13 or 14 when it came out in a different way. And it's sometimes it's yeah. fun just to see the fingerprints of how God kind of breathe life into it across the stages. So sweet or salty when you're writing? Ooh, I'd say I like salty in general, but when writing sweet, because you can just pop a piece of chocolate in your mouth. Yeah. Um, <laughs> tea or coffee? Coffee. Yeah. I'm a coffee gal. Dark roast. Ooh. And do you celebrate when you're done with a book? Yeah, 
but yeah, I think it kind of changes, but in general, sushi is my go-to. I just really love sushi. And so we have a favorite sushi place. And so anytime, you know, a big deadline's over, it's kind of like, all right, and now let's eat some sushi. (laughs) I love that. Yeah. I love that. I'm terrible at celebrating. So, but we're getting better at it. We're getting better at it. That's good. That's (laughs) good. So definitely get really good at it at the beginning so that it's just part of your pattern of celebrating the, yay, we did it. And then you can move on to the next one (laughs) because many of us are terrible at it. So, uh, so where can people find up from the dust? Yeah, yeah, you can go to, well, anywhere books are sold. Um, I know right now Baker Bookhouse is a really great deal. Um, you can find it on Amazon. You can go to my website, which is hmkstories.com slash um, up from dust. And I'll have all those pre-order links there as well as a book club guide is there. Yep. So that would be a great place to go. And the book club guide has recipes and all kinds of fun things yeah. in it. So it's really it's fun. A, it is. I, I was like, oh, I need to do something like that with my book that's coming out soon. Uh, but it has been so much fun to chat with you today. Thank you so much for making time when you could be writing to stop and talk about your new book that's coming out. And it was so much fun to have this time with you. Thank you so much, Heather. Oh, thank you, Kara. It's been a pleasure.